Well, good morning. Today is uh, Sunday, February 25th. We got our Bible class and also Faith at Home with Pastor online. And so, uh, so let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to be together once again as we continue through uh, February in, in the season of Lent. You know, and we're getting close with regards to the Gospel of John. Uh, with uh, we're already been in the week of the Passion, and uh, just think about uh, moving closer to the cross and and your death and resurrection, Lord. We pray you'll continue to bless our study of your Word. We just thank you uh, today in worship. Talk about take up our cross and follow you, Lord. Help us to follow you in everything. Uh, to know that you are our Lord and Savior. We pray everything that you'll bless us, and, and everything that we pray is, is in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. No, actually, beginning chapter 17. But, uh, but I kind of wanted to uh, show the, the context. Um, you know, if you notice in chapter 12, six days before the Passover, Jesus uh, came to Bethany, uh, where there was Lazarus, so he's, you know, already in chapter 12 of John's Gospel, we've uh, started Holy Week. Uh, you know, because we have, um, uh, you know, he's eating at the table, um, you know, Simon's house, we see him at Simon's house, and then uh, I think toward the end, yeah, uh, chapter 12, verse um, uh, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, and um, um, we have the, his progression, his procession uh, into uh, you know to Jerusalem. So we have that Palm Sunday proce procession, and uh, chapter thirteen, the feast of the Passover. You know, we're talking about the Last Supper, pretty much. Uh, we see in verse five, six, uh, or five. Uh, poured a basin, uh, water in a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet. And so we have uh, Palm Sunday in chapter 12, chapter 13, we have uh, in the upper room, the Last Supper, uh, Monday, Thursday. You know, so uh, from chapter 13, and we're in chapter 17 right now, uh, we pretty much are, we're within 24 hours of his crucifixion. Uh, probably less than that. Uh, within about 18 hours of his crucifixion. Uh, so we see the Last Supper. And so I kind of wanted to, uh, like I said, put this all in, in perspective. And then, you know, it's always interesting what we find in John's Gospel and what we don't find in John's Gospel. Uh, you know, it doesn't really say specifically the Last Supper, but that's what really is being talked about. Um, the other Gospels have the Lord's Prayer. Did you know the Lord's Prayer is not in John's Gospel? Uh, but we've been in his prayer for the last three chapters. <laughs> um, you know, whether uh, that's the prayer he prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane, because uh, we really don't have mentioned the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, like, you know, and, and I, I kind of mentioned it before, um, that John wrote his gospel so much later than the other three gospels. The other three gospels are the synoptic gospels. They're called synoptic because they're all similar in nature. John, uh, John assumes that you know all of this stuff. And so he'll, he'll go into explanations and the meaning behind some of the stuff. Uh, that's where we get all the I am passages. Uh, chapter 15, I am the vine. Uh, you know, that's one of the I am passages. We heard, I am the good shepherd, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. You know, and so when we talk about the feeding of the 5,000, yeah, he'll reference the feeding of the 5,000, but he'll explain really the meaning behind the feeding of the 5,000, where you don't really have that in the other three Gospels. Uh, so, so chapter 13 through chapter 17, we pretty much have... Um, the prayer that Jesus is lifting up. Um, chapter 16 is what we just looked at. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. Uh, they will put you out in synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Uh, they do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not do these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now that I'm going to the Father sent me, none of you asked, where are you going? And so, um, but anyway, let, let me get uh, to 
chapter 17, you know, he's lifting up this prayer, but then chapter 17, um, the, the prayer is more specific to the disciples and really to all of us. Uh, and that's kind of what we just came from. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. You know, before he talked about the, the hour is coming. You know, so, so we have in chapter 13, 14, you know, you know I just visualize the fact that we're, it's, it's Holy Week. You know, and now we're on Thursday of Holy Week, Monday, Thursday. We had that in chapter 13. And so these are just the hours prior to him being arrested, going to the cross. When we get to chapter 18, things are going to be moving pretty quickly uh, regarding his passion. And so uh, this has been known as, as his priestly prayer. You got the Lord's Prayer in the other Gospels. This is, is the Lord's priestly prayer. Uh, that culminates in chapter 17, uh, because here uh, it said, the hour has come, verse 1. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me. I have glorified you on earth. Jesus came down to this world in order to live that perfect life. Uh, he did that. He did everything that he was sent to do. Um, now, he's going, still going to suffer, uh, you know, and, and be crucified. And, uh, and we're still going to hear some temptations uh, uh, thrown at him. You know, one of the temptations, we talk about Satan tempting him uh, in the, in, when he was out in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, turn stones to bread, jump from the temple, all these kingdoms will be yours. Um, one of the Gospels, I forget which one it is, but one of the Gospels says that the Satan, Satan left Jesus uh, and waited for an opportune time, you know, to be tempted again. And you wonder, what, what is that opportune time? <laughs> you know, when was Jesus tempted again? Some would reference, the, it's the gospel reading we had today from Mark's gospel, when uh, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Uh, you are, you know, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, Peter speaks out. But then right after that, right after Jesus, when Peter says you are the Christ, Jesus then uh, talks about suffering and dying. And, uh, and Peter responded by saying what? Surely this will not happen to you. You know, we have that in our, in our gospel reading for today. And what was Jesus' response to Peter when he said that? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You could say that was maybe the opportune time Satan came. Uh, at least it was another time that Satan came to Jesus uh, trying to divert him from his mission to go to the cross. Uh, and, and, and who did he use? He used uh, one of Jesus' closest, <laughs> uh, closest disciple, closest friend. Uh, and it's interesting how Satan does that. You know, he'll sometimes speak through well-meaning people. You know, and, and yeah, Peter was, was well-meaning. Um, now, you can look at that, but there, there's another temptation that's yet to come. If this is prior to him being arrested, and we're going to see his, his arrest and before Pilate and all that stuff, uh, there's another temptation that occurred while Jesus is on the cross. You, you recall what temptation that was? And one of the other thieves said, you're the Son of God, save yourself and us. Yeah, I mean, the thief on the cross... Uh, and also the people at the foot of the cross, the soldiers were mocking him. You know, saying that, uh, yeah, he, he saves others, he can't even save himself. You know, if, if you are truly God, come down from the cross. Um, the thief said that, but others at the foot of the cross said it as well. Uh, which, that would have been pretty easy for us, humanly speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was like, I remember uh, uh, James and John, uh, you know, talked about Jesus uh, when people rejected Jesus. You know, they said, uh, that's why Jesus called them sons of thunder. It's like, you want to call down fire from heaven to destroy them. 
Uh, it's like, you, you got the power. Call down fire from heaven to destroy them. You know, just, just think about Jesus up on the cross. He could call down fire from heaven and destroy those people. He could come down from the cross. And, and, and it's, like, uh, it's like, boy, that would be something. You know, why, why didn't Jesus do that? You know, he could have very easily come down from the cross and just, uh, just like he took a whip and ran the people out of the temple. I could see him uh, beaten, scarred, crown of thorns, whatever. All of a sudden, he jumps down off the cross. You know, he, he grabs a whip or a sword from the, you know, and just destroys them. It, 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 you know, it, it, you know it's, it's kind of like the scene from, um, from Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, when they open up the ark, and all of a sudden, you know, you just slayed them all. It's like, why didn't Jesus do that? You know, that, that, was, that was cool. Uh, you know, when, you know, when Harrison Ford was there, you know, he closed your eyes, that's, that's the, and they all get destroyed. Um, it's like, why didn't he do that? That would have been pretty impressive. He could have had a league of angels come down. I know, yeah, yeah. And, of course, that was one of the, Satan's temptations. But because uh, uh, he quoted, but, but it's from one of the Psalms. One of the Psalms talks about, you know, you, you know league of angels, you know, fighting on his behalf. But of course, that was not why Jesus came. It, have been made yeah, yeah, Jesus would have, uh, and, and and Jesus would have thought of himself. Now that kind of goes back to this uh, priestly prayer uh, in chapter seventeen. Um, now I've glorified you by doing what I came to do. Uh, now glorify me, which comes through his death on the cross. Um, you know. Okay, I went backwards, sorry about that. Um, I am no longer in the way of, of the world. And so, so yeah, um, verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them have been lost, except the son of destruction. Talks about Judas there. That the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have the joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. You know, J Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, you know, he, he mentions all of these things, but now he, he is concluding his prayer uh, in chapter 17 by praying for the disciples, that they would be kept you know, in the Father's arms. Uh, he's about to leave them. But of course, we've heard earlier already that the Holy Spirit will be with them. Uh, but verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So in other words, sanctify them with your word. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me. So not only is he praying for disciples, now he's praying for us. Future generations who will follow Jesus and the Father. Verse 24, uh, 24 Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with you where I am and see my glory the cross that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, and that's how chapter 17 ends. So, we see uh, verses, chapters 13 through 17. Uh, really, you could say w whether that was actually the prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which you kind of wonder, I thought John was sleeping through all of this. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but yeah, John certainly was given uh, what was said, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, like I said, it could have been prior to the Garden of Gethsemane, part of the Garden of Gethsemane, all of it, you know, but, uh, but Jesus certainly, at this point in time, knows that his time has come. 
he has glorified God with his life, and now he asks the Father to glorify him through the cross. Uh, and that's where you see the glory of, of, of Christ, because that's where he, he has accomplished what he had came to do. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, Satan wanted to distract him from doing that uh, to accomplish. Um, now here's where I'm kind of, you know, Jesus knew that he had to go to the cross. Um, you know, what did Satan know? Yeah, you got to think that Satan knows that this is something significant, but I don't know that he could grasp what the whole picture of it was. Yeah. Of that Christ actually dying for the sins of the world. I think Satan must have known because he put it in the, in the mind of Peter to try to keep Jesus from going to the cross. Um, I mean, even John the Baptist said, the old Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so I, guess, I, guess, I guess one thing, I, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll look more at that because the thought just came to my mind now. So <laughs> before next week, maybe I'll look it up because what... If Satan, did Satan feel that Jesus' death, that he was defeated? Or did Satan believe in his death that he was, that he himself was defeated? Yeah. You know, because cause we oftentimes look at, at Satan as uh, when Jesus died on the cross that he thought he had won. Did he think he had won? Because if so, then why was he trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross? And so, uh, so yeah, let, let me, let me, let me, because like I, I didn't prepare for that question because it just came to my mind now. But, but it's like, uh, you know, if, if, Jesus, if Satan was trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross, he must have known that the cross was significant. Uh, and so when Jesus died on the cross, that he had won. Or does Satan think that he had won? Um, did, and then, but did he know about the resurrection? Satan. Yeah. Until that. You know, so so maybe maybe the maybe uh, Satan was like, okay, the whole goal was to go to the cross, but you know, so was Satan kind of confused by all that? It's like, but then the resurrection, because because the resurrection, because when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, we need to take the the, the, the cross and the open tomb together. Uh, and really, there's three things we need to take, you know, the cross, the open tomb, and Christ's ascension. Uh, because he went to the Father, and all three really need to be talked about. But in the creed, we talk about he died, descended into hell, rose again, ascended into heaven. There's really four things that's mentioned in the creed. Of course, some creeds leave out him, his descent into hell. Um, because our salvation really is found in the three death, resurrection, ascension. Because ascension shows that, that he's going to go to heaven and prepare a place for us. And so, so, so all three kind of taken together. But that fourth thing, him descending into hell, is when he proclaimed his victory. Right. Um, and so Satan, if he didn't know that he was defeated at the cross, he knew he was defeated prior to Christ's resurrection because Jesus descended into hell and proclaimed his victory. And so, so Satan's like, I thought you were dead. Uh, and his resurrection is, is proof to everyone else. And so, so Satan, Satan kind of got a, um, uh, you know, what's, the, what's the, a movie when it first comes out? You always have that first showing. Uh, what do you call that? A premiere? Yeah. So, 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 uh, so Satan saw the premiere <laughs> showing of Jesus' resurrection when Christ sent the hell, proclaimed his victory. Uh, and then when he, but, but the resurrection is, is vital because the resurrection is proof that the payment of sin made by Jesus on the cross was accepted by his father in heaven. You know, God, the father accepted that payment and his resurrection is really proof of that. Um, and, and of course, there's nothing about this that's it's easy because like later, you know, in Gethsemane, he's, he's still conflicted and saying, is there any way around this? Yeah. You know, Jesus still was human. But he probably knew that he would be separated from God, like you said, 
my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, yeah. So I don't think Jesus was ever tempted to not fulfill his mission to save the world. I don't think there was ever, I don't think he was ever tempted to not fulfill that mission. The temptation was, you know, is there some other way? Well, I think that's what he prayed. That wasn't really temptation, but that's just what he prayed in the garden. If there's any other way, but not my will, but thy will be done. You know, Jesus was resolute. Uh, he was firm in his goal, his mission, to go to the cross. He wasn't going to let Satan deter him. He wasn't going to let Satan using Peter to deter him. He wasn't going to let Satan using the people at the foot of the cross or the thief on the cross to deter him. Uh, he, he was focused. And so like I said, the question I'm going to try to uh, answer and come back next week and see if I can get some more answers to that is, uh, is was Satan really aware of him being defeated through Christ's death? Um, you know, because, because we've often said that, that when Jesus died, that, that, that Satan thought he had won. He's like, I don't know. You know, it, it, he was trying to keep him from dying. He was trying to keep him from going to the cross. And so, and so, 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 the, so the cross uh, was the goal. Uh, so I'm not sure Satan really thought he had won. I don't know what well, we've often referred, looked at it in that way. So, so anyway, um, uh, faith and homeless pastor. We're going to look at it next week, and we'll answer that question. But, uh, um, but anyway, uh, chapter seventeen concludes. I want to get in chapter eighteen a little bit because now we've now things are going to progress pretty quickly. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden. So this, this appears as if this happened prior to the garden. It doesn't say the garden of Gethsemane, it just says the garden, uh, which he and his disciples entered. And so, so the prayer kind of continues. Um, and so you kind of think if this has all happened at the Last Supper, then uh, and, and Jesus shared a prayer. Uh, yeah, if you guys complain at me at having a dinner prayer that lasts a little long, uh, Jesus, and, you know, if, if this was the case, Jesus had a dinner prayer that lasted four chapters, uh, three chapters. Uh, it's like they were getting pretty hungry. It's like, come on, I'm, I'm you know, food's here. Um, I don't know. But anyway, uh, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place where Jesus often met with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons, then Jesus, knowing all that would be what happened to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him, uh, was standing with them when, when Jesus said to, to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you have gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, where he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Oh, let's just stop right there, verse 14. Um, and yeah, once again, John Style uh, so yeah, you know Caiaphas, right? You know, you've heard it from the other Gospels. He's the one who said, uh, you know, that one person should die. Um, I, I think that's just one of the most remarkable verses in the Scripture. Um, and it goes to show how God can use anybody. He can use unholy people. People who with ulterior motives. Caiaphas was high priest that year. 
And Caiaphas is one who says, uh, and of course, his meaning was totally different than how God intended it. Uh, but when Caiaphas finally, and this, this followed the raising of Lazarus. You know, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, that's when the, that's when the, the Pharisees and the chief priests and teachers of the law, they said, we got to do something about this guy. You know, rather than believing the fact that he could raise, raise people from the dead, that maybe he actually is of God, uh, they refused, you know, that's how hardened their hearts were. Their hearts were so hardened that they refused to believe, even though he rose, raised somebody from the dead. So he raised Lazarus from the dead. It's like, uh, and of course, you know, yeah, he raised a couple other people prior to that, but maybe they weren't really dead. Uh, and so, so it's like, you know, you guys, you guys not getting it. Let me, let me make sure that Lazarus is dead. Let me keep him in the tomb for four days. Uh, that, 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 that's what, that way there's no question. Uh, but anyway, he raised Lazarus, and so how the, the, the high priests and the, and the chief priests and the Pharisees respond, you know, we got to get rid of this guy. Uh, so that's where things really started to happen. Uh, got Judas. Uh, but, but Caiaphas spoke, you know, finally when they said, what are we going to do? And that's when Caiaphas says, it is expedient that one man should suffer than for the whole nation to perish. Those were the words of Caiaphas. It is, it is better that one man should die than for the whole nation to perish. So this killed Jesus because better for that to happen than for all of us to be, you know, run out by the Romans, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, but Caiaphas, like, yeah, there's, an, there's a spiritual meaning to that. It is expedient that one man should suffer, Jesus, then the whole nation perish, not the people of Israel who are occupied by the Romans. No, the nation that, that, that he's talking about, that God is referring to, is all of us, all mankind. And it's better that Jesus die for all of us than for all of us to, to die spiritually in hell forever. Um, that's how God and meant that to be interpreted. That's not how Caiaphas interpreted it, but that's how God interpreted it. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Who do you think the other disciple was? John. John. <laughs> John oftentimes doesn't refer to himself uh, when he writes about himself. Uh, he's a, Peter and that other disciple. Uh, you know, the one that Jesus loved, it's like, now he's really bragging on himself there. But because uh, everyone knows that it was John. Since the disciple was known. Now this was interesting. The, since the disciple was known to the high priest. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. That, that's, where, that's where I really believe. Why was John at the foot of the cross and not any, any other disciple? I kind of I sense that. Well. It's for many reasons. I mean, God certainly protected John. The other disciples, they were nowhere to be found because they didn't want to be arrested. Why wasn't John worried? Uh, was John just braver? Maybe. Had to be there so that Jesus could look to John and say, take care of my mother. Uh, but I think maybe part of it is that John was known by the high priest and the people and, and, and the guard um, to the point where he wasn't as worried about himself as the others were. Um, maybe he had a get out of jail free card. <laughs> I don't know. But, but he wasn't as concerned, uh, I think. Uh, and I think that verse is partly the reason for that. Uh, to go back a page, I thought, I think it's interesting where they come into the garden, Jesus says, who do you see? And uh, they say Jesus of Nazareth. And here you get the embodiment of God saying, I am. Okay. And they fall back. That's amazing to me. Yeah, no, I'm glad you pointed that out because we did, we mentioned that on several different occasions. One of the, the most beautiful things in the Gospel of John is all the I am passages. 
I'm the good shepherd, I'm the way, the truth, and life, I'm the resurrection of life, I'm the vine, you're the bread, I'm the door, I'm the gate. Uh, all those I am passages. Uh, but yeah, let's not be dismissive of uh, verse 4, verse 5. I am he. And then verse 6, she says, I am he. And they drew back and fell to the ground. Um, is, is, yeah, can you not, I mean, it would make sense that we would connect that to that I am of the Exodus. Yeah. <clears throat> I am who I am. If nothing else, in that, that the, in, in God's mouth, that I am is very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question. Why um, wouldn't the people that John Judas took with him, they don't recognize Jesus yet? <laughs> I, I mean, they're asking, yeah. you know, what kind of new are you looking for? You know, they didn't recognize him. Well, it's dark out and Jesus might not have been wearing a white robe. That was all our, our artwork. Always shows him wearing a white robe. Probably no hate though. That's it. That's it. So maybe to confirm, you tell you tell us who you are. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just like in a hospital, you check the patients on you. Yeah. Say your name again or something. Yeah. Like just to make it work out. Yeah. I think I think they kind of. Uh, Christmas. What do you think? Oh, you know, make sure all the T's were crossed and the I's dotted. Uh, it's like okay. Uh, from a legal standpoint, want to make sure that uh, the person, the right yeah, they got the right guy. So, the, does it say that Judas kissed him, um, or or just uh, that that there he is? Because other gospels talk about Jesus, uh, you know, kissed him, um, and then Jesus says, "Judas, do you betray, betray me with a kiss?" Um, doesn't really say that there, but yeah, he pointed him out. But you know, but I say that they don't. They didn't. They didn't follow protocol to a certain extent. Yeah, they did. You know, like okay, we want someone to point him out. So so yeah, so so that could be legally binding. But but they are about to do things that that is isn't according to protocol. Uh, because when he was arrested, they, they had a trial in the middle of the night without any forewarning. Uh, it was a sham of a trial. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I picture Pharisees being w awakened in their home. You know, a knock on the door. It's like, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't care. You need to get to Pilate's courtyard. Uh, we're having a trial. It's like, what? You know, that's not how it's done. You know, so, so there, there are certain things that were done that wasn't according to protocol. Um, so, so, yeah, it was a sham of a trial to a certain extent. Uh, it was all thrown together. Um, they had to produce witnesses. They kind of got a few people together. So, like, yeah, he did claim to be the Christ. Um, but even then, uh, they're trying to, and of course we're jumping the gun here, but they, they're trying to present a pilot with a crime. Um, you know, and, and I like uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. They, 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 have, they have a modern version of that. They have two, two different versions, the, the traditional version, and then you have a, a, one that came out 20, 30 years later. Uh, I think the newer version actually had word, words that changed a little bit. But I remember one of the one of the songs that Pilate is singing. He says, "I need a crime. <laughs> I need a crime." You know, you keep telling me to to crucify this this man, but give me something. Give me a crime. Uh, because all you've given me is and he claims to be God. It's like I don't care. It's like that means nothing to me. Uh, black, you know, but but that's what they hung their hat on because according to Jewish law, blasphemy is, is worthy of death, but not Roman law. You know, you, anybody can claim to be God, it's like, that's not, but he also claimed to be a king. It's like, yeah, that's kind of, uh, but he says, my kingdom's not of this world. 
So Caesar has nothing to fear, but at least there's something that they can actually give to Pilate that that could uh, cause this person to die. Um, and of course, they didn't care how he died. They prefer to stone him because that's how they took care of blasphemy, stoning. Uh, but but that's that's what's that's what's always neat when you think about fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, prophecy in, in scripture talks a lot about you know, and even even lifting on a pole. You know, even the even the parallel of um, of Moses lifted up a serpent, and, and whoever looked at that serpent on a pole. You know, that's referenced in the New Testament as as a foreshadowing of Jesus. Now, now, if you looked in the Old Testament, why would they even think that that would be foreshadowing uh, a cruci? Uh, they didn't know what a crucifixion was, you know, back in the time of Moses. Uh, so the lifting up of the serpent, there's no way that they would ever, ever look at that as as foreshadowing the Messiah. <laughs> you know, it's like why would they even think that? But but then now that they're occupied by the Romans and their form of cruci uh, of, of punishment is crucifixion uh, up on a tree and say so oh <laughs> there's something in the Old Testament that kind of, you know talk about you know so so they can make the, the connection only in retrospect not not at the time you know which which is just the beauty of Scripture the beauty of Scripture and the fulfillment of Scripture uh, you know, there's there's a there's a graphic. I need to probably put it up put it up next time. Uh, but um, this was you know, I've seen a lot on Instagram and other stuff. But uh, but it talks about had had lines drawn from New Testament, Old Testament, fulfilling the prophecies. And it's just a beautiful picture of all of these lines going from one to the other, and and how how New Testament you know is just a beautiful fulfillment of the prophecies found in the Old Testament. I'm going to try to find that graphic, and I'll put it up for next week. It's just, it's just a beautiful graphic of, uh, of the connection of one to the other. It's good stuff that we just <clears throat> humanly, you know, people there in, in Jesus' time, um, couldn't imagine, you know, God's plan of salvation. I mean, now we can look back at Genesis 3, talked about the seed of the woman mm -hmm. crushing Satan's head. Yeah. Uh, it's like, well, see, with one of that was that's weird to talk about there anyway. Yeah. But that was in the prophecy. But still, people's thought about sin and forgiveness was sacrificing animals and bringing grain and stuff to burn on the altar, and ah, we're done. But it's like, in retrospect, in the New Testament perspective, we say. No, that was just looking forward to uh, who's really going to take away sin. Yeah. I mean, just, just think about literature today. Uh, many of you guys are readers. I mean, I know, Barb, you're a huge reader. I think all, you know, many of you guys probably are probably readers. But, uh, uh, you know, and, and these, she'll talk about some, some mystery novels, whatever. And uh, it's always kind of uh, neat when you, when you see... Uh, uh, it's like Sherlock Holmes, you know, how he somehow figures the case out because of, you know, and, 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 and when, the, when the author is able to write it in such a way where uh, there, was, there was clues and all of a sudden uh, you see the answer to those clues. And uh, it's like, boy, that was, that's, what a great writer to be able to come up with a story that has these neat little connections. Uh, you know, you're reading something, you think this person did it, then you may think that, but, and then eventually you come to, come to a conclusion. And, and this thought, author, you know, ends up being brilliant. Now think about scripture. <laughs> you know, it's like, like, you know, how in the world can connections like this be made? Uh, you know, talk about the whole lamb. Talk about the you know, lamb of God, you know, and, and Jesus being sacrificed. Or, or like I said, you, you mentioned Genesis chapter 3 and the seed of the woman uh, and, and, and how that's carried out throughout Scripture and then finds its fulfillment in the New Testament. Uh, and, 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 and these prophecies are written 1,500 to 2,000 years prior to their fulfillment. Uh, and yet we see a beautiful, it's like we can't find a writer today that, can, that is that brilliant. 
And then, then to have that done multiple times uh, throughout Scripture, how could it be thing, anything other than the hand of God? You know, it's like uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle isn't that brilliant, even though he's quite brilliant. <laughs> you know, you know how you know, it's just it's it's just the beauty of Scripture. But uh, okay, let's uh, then we're gonna stop here and kind of pick up. Uh, but yeah, it's gonna get. Exciting, I guess, in a certain way. But, um, you know, just like Good Friday is good, but, yeah, sad. But uh, but let's close with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be in above to us all. Amen.